Welcome to the latest in our series of Instagram Lives. Um, and I think Romla's actually just joined, so I will actually just add her now, which makes it a lot easier for me because it's less talking to myself. So let me just add her. So Romla is joining us from Minnesota. Hi. Salam alaikum. Hello, <laughs> How are you? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. Okay, um, let me just check everything. Sorry, this is a bit awkward, but I just need yeah. to check my sound and stuff. Yeah. And um, yeah. sorry about this. No worries. I'm new to this too, so I'll be honest, it's quite exciting. <laughs> sorry, it's just the beginning is the technical part where we just kind of make sure everything's fine. Yeah. Um, so um, I was going to introduce you, but I, I think it's working quite well. So um, I'll introduce myself quickly. My name's Alia. I work for She Speaks We Here. I've been writing for them and since lockdown we've changed our focus to do more kind of Instagram lives. We are doing seminars and YouTube videos um, and we've put these series on since last year and it's been working really well. Um, and Rumla, I think especially if you introduce yourself, so I'll hand over to you. Yeah. And why don't you introduce yourself? Okay, thank you. So I hope you can hear me very well. Um, I'm Ramla Kasozi. And yes, I'm live from Minnesota, um, which is in considered the Midwest of the U.S. A little bit about myself. I was born in Uganda, East Africa, um, but I grew up in Canada as uh, I, we, my family, we left there when I was very young. So I'm a former refugee. So I grew up there in Toronto. So Toronto's like a second hometown for me. Um, also went to school there, did my undergraduate there. I went to University of Guelph just for my bachelor's uh, degree, but then I decided to go back home to Uganda, and that's where I did medicine, which was the best uh, experience I've ever had, a great practical experience. It was also an opportunity for me to get to know my roots. Um, it's also a place I met my husband. So after medical school, I worked in Uganda for a while, especially in resource-limited areas. Uh, but because I still felt like I needed to get more clinical skills, more training and understand health system structures, um, I was fortunate to come to the U.S. and then get um, a fellowship uh, with the Center for Disease Control and also do my master's in public health at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Did some research there, also worked a bit in Ohio, then uh, decided to re-enter the clinical field. And so currently I'm a family medicine resident at the University of Minnesota. Uh, what that means, I think in the UK terms, that's more of like, you know, you finish your medical training, um, but then you're trying to specialize as further training. Um, and so after that, I'm eligible to, uh, it's a three-year training program. After that, I can do my exam and then I uh, can work independently. Um, so even though I'm with the University of Minnesota, what we discuss here, just a disclaimer, um, uh, the views and opinions I express does not necessarily, uh, you know, reflect that of University of Minnesota or uh, the Minnesota Academy of Family Physicians. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's nice to have you on here. Um, this is such a great opportunity because, um, um, you know, it's, there's so much uh, conversation, at least in the UK, media, I'm sure it's the same in the US, about yeah. kind of, um, ethnic, I, I, you know, this is the other thing is like we call them ethnic minority communities, BAME communities. I mean, this, that's just a term we're using just to kind of describe ethnic minorities, even though it's not the ideal term, but just kind of so much conversation about, and we'll come back to that, um, about BAME communities and how actually they're much more likely to kind of suffer adverse effects of COVID. But yeah. then there's also now with the vaccine coming out, this kind of hesitancy of certain groups to take up the jab. Um, yeah. And I think that's being reported, but it's not much reason to say why. Um, and I was wondering what your opinion on that was. Like, first mm -hmm. of all, why are they more likely to suffer adverse effects of COVID? And then secondly, um, the, the stat about the vaccine, because there are lots of stats that show that they're less likely to, to take up the vaccine as well. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a great point. And so, you know, I've been also trying to do the research and understand the political and social dynamic of the UK as well. And yeah. also here in the US. And for me, you know, I've been fortunate because I've lived in three different countries, went to school in three different countries. And um, I feel like from Uganda to Canada to US, um, there's something very common. There's that impact, I feel, of, you know, systemic racism and also colonialism, which I feel has really affected how you know, so-called minorities, you know, respond to particular um, 
uh, these interventions. And I think what we have to understand first and even acknowledge, especially here in the US, there's that really legacy of inequality and structural racism that has led really to unequal access to just healthcare in general. Uh, colonialism yeah. in itself, um, even when I look back at, you know, in Uganda, uh, has also led to unequal access of certain groups to health um, situations. Um, even in the UK as well, you know, uh, it's immigrants, and yet, I don't know why they call us immigrants, yet they came to our country and exploited our resources, but yet we came to their country and all of a sudden we're foreigners. And so yeah. the common link with that ear part is that because of colonialism or slavery, depending on where you are in this world, there's always been that common thread of white supremacy, um, which has denied us access to health and housing and even financial stability. Furthermore, there's that impact of medicine. And I think people don't realize that medicine in itself has really a dark history in legitimizing the inferiority of certain groups, mostly, of course, you know, Black individuals, Asians, and Chinese, so much so there's been experimentation. Experimentation that was forced, um, especially here in the U.S. I don't know if you've heard of, there's, there, he's known as the so-called father of gynecology, um, uh, Mr. Sims, but, and there's even a speculum that was named after him. But mm -hmm. a lot of people are realizing, actually, you know, he did atrocious things to especially black women, you know, try to perfect uh, a particular surgical repair, which is called a fistula repair, uh, without using anesthesia. And he used some black women and black slaves to test that procedure. And then once he perfected it, then on the white woman, he decided to use anesthesia because he felt that black people did not feel pain. There are many examples and uh, several also have happened in the UK similarly. And so because yeah. of that, I call it trauma, what I call racial trauma, generational trauma. Um, yeah. That distress is very valid. Even for me, when I see my patients, I, I welcome that distrust because it is grounded in historical yeah. trauma. I think what is happening is that we have to realize who's controlling the narrative and it's mostly white establishments. And so it is hard for them to fathom that actually it was their fault why we have distrust. I think a lot of people try to look for other reasons, but racism in itself through colonialism, through slavery, a lot of people find that a hard pill to swallow and will not want to focus on that. And so I feel that's the common thread with which, um, you know, individuals actually just are very hesitant about COVID vaccination because they feel, is this something the government is up to? Are they trying to experiment on me? But they don't realize when you talk to these communities, there is historical and generational trauma why a lot of individuals distrust the health system and because of that systemic racism. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And I guess also there's just, I work in kind of research as well. So I'm just thinking from a research perspective a lot of research has also got that kind of, I guess, white gaze. And so it's very difficult to get proper research done in actual question that those groups to actually find out what the reason is. So maybe there isn't much focus on finding out the reason, simply because even research has that kind of gaze to it, I guess. Um, so, I mean, you gave an example of the gynecology. There are many other examples, but that's just one. Um, I know you, you mentioned there's something else as well, that lungs as well, or... Yeah, so there's also another, um, so there was this, oh, a long time ago, of course, during the slavery time, another doctor, uh, he was known as Samuel Cartwright. And so what he did was he created an instrument and it's called the spirometer. Um, if you ever have time, there's a book really uh, that individuals should read. It's called Breathing Race into the Machine. And it discusses that history of the spirometer which right now in medicine, we still use that tool to determine somebody's lung function. Unfortunately, oh that particular tool and other medical tools use race as a correction because it was thought that black individuals had poor lung functions and that is why they needed to work in the plantations and pick cotton to improve their lung function. And so this yeah. parameter has a race per, uh, correction. Now, the trouble with that is one, it's very problematic at many layers. First, 
um, you know, the slaves, the black individuals were outside exposed to environmental exposures. Cotton itself has a lot of debris, which can be very detrimental to lung function. And so if yep. you're exposed to that for 20 hours a day, of course your lungs will be bad. Uh, whereas the white people were inside sheltered, not exposed to environmental exposure. So of course they had lung function. So yeah. his instrument failed to sort of um, acknowledge that factor and it continues to do so today. I think right yeah. now medicine is trying to find a better tool. I think more yeah. importantly, what is important to discuss is that race in itself, a lot of people have not defined that properly. And I think the reason why there's all this you know discussion is that research and medicine has decided to use race as a biological proxy when it's not race in itself is a social construct which was created literally by white supremacy and colonialism to really fortify the need to you know have uh you know to be superior to other races and so with that premise that is why i feel like there's a lot of inequalities and research has really uh, pushed uh, for race to con be considered a biology so that they can push particular agendas, which is very unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. Because I feel like uh, there's so little discussion around why COVID. And I, you know, we did run a, a seminar last week and I, I don't know if we 100% got the answer of like, well, actually, why are there more deaths and actual worst symptoms there's also stats to show there's worse symptoms as well yeah. right yeah um and what you're saying there's not much delving into that so i'd be interested to hear your perspective from the doctor but also yeah i guess that you know there's a conversation that maybe people don't want to have <laughs> it's much easier to say it's biology i guess you know it's much yeah. simpler conversation <laughs> so well it's just your biology um yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's just saying many people do not know how biology is steeped in racism. And, you know, we did, a, I've done a degree in, you know, biomedical sort of chemistry and things like that, but we never discussed the history of it. And your perspective is really interesting to hear the kind of things that we never hear about. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think the reality is, and what I'm slowly doing, like intentionally doing, we have to unlearn that narrative. Because yeah. you realize we went through an educational system that had just white narrative. You know, they told yeah. us, this is white literature. You have to read Shakespeare. You know, this is medicine. But of course, medicine was created by white individuals who were trying to push for this white superiority. And when you really read deep, and that's what I've been intentionally trying to do even as a physician, most of the information that we have read, even the clinical tools that we use to diagnose our patients, are steeped in racism. So like I told you, there's that lung function, there's even now kidney function. Um, there's now a huge national, actually international movement to remove race on a particular kidney function because studies upon studies have shown that yeah. it has caused inequality and limited access to a kidney transplant because we're using race correction. And mm. so um, I came across a very interesting article and this is actually written um, by um, British physicians in the, um, BMJ or the British Medical Journal, and they discussed um, mitigating ethnic disparities within COVID-19 and beyond. I think it was the author is Mohammed Razai. And so this is a great article where they discuss the elements of racism causing the disparities. And what we have to realize is because of the legacy of racism, unfortunately, especially mostly black people and indigenous or native Americans, have had one, limited access, of course, we said to healthcare services. And I know just like in UK and also here in the US, there's this concept of where our housing has been very inadequate. If you notice, we are living in very crowded areas. We live yeah. in groups of people, which does not facilitate social distancing. So when COVID hit and you're telling, mm. you know, a really close knit family with their limited housing to social distance, you're like, how? And yet they don't realize that in itself, the housing situation and the community, like the projects as they call it, are steeped in racism in itself, which has led to those health inequalities. Another thing is that unfortunately, people of color are working in professions where there's constant you know, interaction yeah. with individuals. So people are in transport or they're environmental services. You know, they're working in cafeterias, in the food services. These are individuals 
who need that job so that they get health insurance so that they can pay their bills. And now you're yeah. telling them with COVID when they hit, you know, they, they can't do that. And they don't realize because of racism and inadequate access to good jobs, education, you know, yeah. they're stuck with jobs, which does not allow them to work remotely or even social distance. So hence their predisposition, of course, to COVID. And so I think a lot of people, what they're missing, and I would say mostly white people, is that they fail to understand that there's been this institutional racism, this white supremacy that has imposed these different layers in housing, in occupation, and in health. So much so this inequality has not really allowed individuals to do the yeah. proper um, you know, social distancing, wearing masks, having access to doctors. And sadly, the reason why, you know, individuals of color may be, you know, pro more prone to COVID is, yes, they may have those medical conditions like diabetes, um, you know, also hypertension. But once again, it's due to limited access to healthcare services where they can't even go and have a checkup. So yeah. what I want to remove from the picture, there's no biology behind this, actually. This is all structural. Uh, which is a social construct that has led to that. And the people who are uncomfortable having that conversation are white people, mostly white people, because yeah. they don't want to acknowledge that, you know, institutional racism, white supremacy that has caused all these disparities. Yeah, because, you know, I guess what you're saying also is, from a biological perspective, <clears throat> what is race anyway? Because you're saying it's a social construct and it's based on much more and the color of your skin and what you look like. If you're talking about genes and history of genetics and things like that, race is not that easy to, to define, I guess. So how do you even define it biologically, I guess? How do you put people into those categories? Yeah, and you know, and it's interesting because once again, I go back to, and this is so, um, I've been redoing re a lot of medical reading. And if you look at this type of stuff that was published, not only here in the US, even in British medical journals, you know, in the 1800s, where, you know, they had a model of the skull and trying to show that we, as Black people, had a reduced brain size. And so somehow our race was, you know, biological, that we were meant to be inferior and white people were meant to be superior. Uh, you know, when they came to countries like my Uganda, where back when, with colonialism, you know, they said that we were savages because we didn't dress like them, we didn't pray like them, we didn't eat like them, we didn't talk like yeah. them, you know, yeah. all of them. So because of that, you know, want of to justify white supremacy, they needed medicine, which they used very effectively and efficiently to prove yeah. that, you know what, we are better because there's something in biology. But up to now, like you said, there's no DNA structure. And so the institution of racism and white supremacy is the one that created race because, you know, race, like I said, is a social construct because there's been also so many geographical movements. Like, how can you say somebody is black? Like, how black is black? You have yeah. somebody who's biracial, could be triracial, you know, especially with kidney function, like I mentioned earlier. Um, there's something called the glomerular filtration rate, which lets us know how effectively the kidney is working. And they decided way back when through a weird calculation to put race. But when you look at the primary literature, once again, they fail to define race. Because, you know, how when a patient who has a mother who's black and, a, you know, a father who's white, how are you going to identify them in that calculator? Because what happens if you say if they're black, that EGFR uh, assumes they're healthy. But if they're white, the EGFR assumes, you know what, they need a kidney transplant. So studies have shown when you use that correction, the access to a nephrologist, to a kidney, uh, but, is yeah. really reduced in a black person. And so through that initial movement, now I know here, especially with the National Kidney Foundation, I know hopefully next month we're praying that they're going to officially just make a nationwide um, you know, announcement to remove that race correction. But I know other institutions are removing it, have removed it already. Because yeah. that literature did not define race properly. They used it inappropriately. Um, race cannot be used like you know, you're trying to quantify the amount of blood. You can't do that with race. Uh, because race, there's been a lot of geographical movement, so much so 
that, you know, some people may not realize people are doing ancestry, you know, and DNA, whatever. And you find that you have even 3% blackness. Mm -hmm. So for us to be defined as black or Asian or whatever, that is a definition. People don't realize white people have put upon us. We have not labeled ourselves that. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And, yeah. um, so um, now thinking about kind of the vaccine and things like that. Um, so there's, it's interesting you're talking about the kind of the history of it. And it seems like, you know, there is a real re tangible reason why certain groups and people of color are hesitant about taking it. Um, are there any kind of particular side effects that people should be concerned about? Or, um, you know, what is your kind of advice on people who are in two minds about taking it? That yeah. Kind of thing? Yeah. Um, and you have doubts. Right. And, and those doubts are very, like I said earlier, very valid and understandable. And yeah. so um, the vaccines that we have available in the U.S., and I think also the U.K., you guys may have it, but you may have another type too. So they're known as messenger RNAs. What essentially that means is that a messenger RNA, think of it as like a, a small protein that codes for a particular, um, you know, protein of the virus. So um, it's not being inoculated or given to the active virus. Rather, um, if you've seen that image of the coronavirus, it's very beautiful with all these red spikes. And so <laughs> that message RNA here like codes for those spikes. And what it does is that when it goes in there, it actually enters the cell, like your small cell, and it kind of tricks your, the machinery of your cell to create antibodies um, and so actually to create the spike protein so that your immune system creates antibodies so that whenever, if you were to have COVID, it remembers how it looks like and it will fight it. So essentially, and that's what I like to tell people, we are not injecting uh, an active COVID virus. So the, the vaccination itself is inactivated, unlike the flu vaccine, which is um, act active. And so usually um, there are two doses um, we have the Pfizer here in the U.S. and the Moderna, and you're supposed to have two doses, and then um, they're separated by a couple of weeks, usually four weeks or 21 days. And, and so usually the first dose, I myself have completed the series. Most commonly, uh, once you get the jab or the shot, you'll get the soreness of the arm on the first shot, and then you're pretty okay. I've usually told people, you know what, it's okay if you want to take well, here we call it acetaminophen, but there I think it's paracetamol uh, or panadol. Yep. You take it, then you'll be fine. Um, now, it's the second dose where some people have experienced maybe they feel a little achy, a little sore, a bit tired. And so we've told individuals to, you know, take it easy when you take that second shot. But usually it's like an overnight thing and then you're fine. Okay. Even for me, I remember I think I just had an overnight chill, but then I was okay. Um so that's what to expect with the two shots, right? And now why people, I understand why some people are hesitant about it because a lot of people are wondering, well, this thing was created with such speed. Like, how did we get a vaccine so quickly? And yeah. I admit, like, I was also very skeptical. I was just like, this is very strange. Um, what people don't realize is actually the science. Uh, so this particular vaccination is what we call nanotechnology. Okay, so this is really understanding at a very nano level that they already had a template for this. So if you recall, there was the SARS, um, you know, outbreak, the Middle Eastern SARS. So there's been various SARS outbreaks. So they've actually been working on a vaccine, but I think because of COVID, what had happened that that research became more escalated and there's more funding and they could produce it at such a speed that it yeah. was granted. And so I always tell people that, you know what, the template existed. Think of the skeleton was there. Um, but like with science and biology, it needs money and funding and some sort of political push. And hence why we got the COVID vaccine. And I know here we had an emergency authorization, which meant that um, so far the, the vaccine is effective. But of course, we're still learning about the safety profile. Yeah. But I tell individuals the reason why I got the shot and, you know, and everyone is entitled to their opinion and their choice is that because for me, a person of color, I work, uh, you know, in a very high dense COVID area. I have seen too much death. 
you know, I have family and I'm just trying to protect myself and my community and my family. Um, because as a black person, statistically, you know, I will probably not do well if I have that infection. And if I'm down, that yeah. is days lost of work, loss of income, then it's hard to claim insurance. And I'm just out yeah. compared to a white person who may have more financial resources. So I usually tell my patients, especially my patients of color, you got to remember, you're trying to get yourself out of that cycle of poverty. And okay. the one asset that you have is your health. And if your health is out, you know, then you can't get wealth. And so that's what I tell people that um, just think of your health as your wealth. If you don't have your health, you'll not get the money and you won't help your family. So I encourage people to read as much information about the COVID vaccine, um, but to really strongly consider taking it. I think it's safe. It's very effective. But I'm also respectful of their decision because there's been a lot of trauma in the medical field. And I think we as physicians have a lot of work to do to gain back the trust. And that's yeah. another thing I've noticed with media. I really hate it when they say, oh, they mistrust us. I'm like, you're not asking the right question. There's a reason why we mistrust you. What do you need to do to gain our trust? And yeah. I think that's what we need to work on. I, I really like that you say that because there's almost a narrative here of, oh, they're not taking it. Why not? They're not taking it without any kind of digging in and finding out about, because then it comes down to, well, actually what has caused this mistrust and that perhaps they don't want to scratch beneath the surface of that. But um, I, w I want to ask you, like, I'm sure it's the same in the US and there's a lot of narrative here, even now, year off, we're kind of year after. Um, and there's still a lot of narrative about, is this real? Do we need a lockdown? Um, and obviously in the in the UK, you can't really see behind the scenes. So I wanted to ask you as someone who has directly kind of been in that in, in the healthcare setting and seen it for yourself. How does it make you feel when people say this is real, this is fake, and this is a conspiracy theory and, and all that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, how uh, and that's a that's an excellent question and i'll be honest it's it's rather frustrating you know and especially early on when the pandemic was happening i mean we were seeing everything live you know we were seeing our patients dying we're like this is a, a disease we can't joke about and we're trying to educate it and unfortunately you know covid became so politicized so much so hi <laughs> these are my daughters okay um, i'm on a live interview and so uh, those, they wanted to make a little hello. This is my second one. <laughs> so, yeah, unfortunately, it's become very political, you know, and yeah. a lot of people have politicized COVID. And I'm sure and I've seen it also in the UK and also here and also in Uganda, um, mm -hmm. because people have some political game. There's a certain group of people who intentionally do not want to invest in really public health services and resources that we need in order to, you know, fight COVID. And, yes. and I know here, especially in the U.S., at least the most European countries were really on top of it. But I know in the U.S., it took us a while to respond. And that's just because there was a lot of naysayers. But I think once it affected people's families or even once they got COVID, it's like they, they converted. And so... Yeah. Um, I think the reason why there's been that sort of, you know, people not taking it seriously or in denial is just it became too political for no reason whatsoever. Um, granted, I know some people also had, you know, their distrust with the government and thought it was a conspiracy. I get it. But, you know, when you're seeing the numbers climb, it's something you can't ignore. And so thankfully, you know, our public health system, especially with the Center for Disease Control, they've really tried to push for, you know, we got to do this right. Um, it's sad that we've lost so many individuals that people are finally believing. And, and I think that's what it took, honestly, that a lot of people dying, a lot of people losing their mothers and fathers, and then finally they wake up. Yeah, it, it, it's actually just horrible that people have to actually see it to actually believe it is, is a very hard reality that we've had to face, I think. Um, I, I want to kind of go back to what you were saying about um, inequality amongst black, black people and also people of other ethnic backgrounds. Do you think that COVID has really shined a light on the inequality much more than before? Do you think this had an effect on that? Um, what do you think? that has done COVID? Is it the pandemic that's done? Do you think? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and that's an excellent question. I know early on during the p- pandemic, um, some people were saying, "Oh, COVID is the you know the equalizer," but uh, a lot of us we were saying, "No, it is not," uh, because we realized that it actually I feel exacerbated the inequalities. Like right. I mentioned yeah. earlier, you know, you had already individuals who at baseline had limited access to healthcare services. Uh, were in per- particular professions where they could not social distance at all. They couldn't yeah. space out. You know, if you're a bus driver, a taxi driver, Uber driver, and you use that for your income, how are you going to tell me to social distance? How am I going to feed my children? How am I going to pay for my child's college? And exactly. then at the same time, housing. You know, you're living in the projects. You're living in a crowded area. How yeah. are you going to social distance? And so when we had COVID, and they were telling us, wear a mask, social distance, don't come to work. That was like, how are you going to, you know, how is that going to happen to especially mostly people of color or refugees? Mm-hmm. Because we are in jobs where we can't, you know, work remotely. We live in places where we can't social mm-hmm. distance and we're just in contact with a lot of people. And so, yes, I feel mm-hmm. not only did it exacerbate, I think it also finally showed, yes, you know, there's a lot of racism. Um, I'm not sure if in the UK you have this history, but I know in the US there's this history of redlining, meaning um, way back when uh, it was like, some people say in the 1800s, but it was actually official under the federal housing department where they literally blocked off created lines to show, oh, this is more real estate versus less real estate. Um, Black people live here, white people live here. It kind of, it actually introduced segregation so much so due Mm. to where the zip code you lived in and we even have now research here in the u.s to show that certain zip codes in certain areas have been hit hard by covid and those same areas were actually drawn out areas by redlining due to segregation yeah and so i think with covid that exacerbated the situation as well and I like to think that, you know, people are finally, you know, appreciating it. But to be honest, I think people always knew, like you said earlier, they always knew the elephant was in the room, but they just didn't want to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I mean, I think um, it's interesting what you're saying about the UK versus the US, because, you know, obviously, you know, during the early part, after the beginning of the pandemic, we had like the Black Lives Matter movement. And there was protests in the UK as well. But there was almost kind of a, a far-right media narrative that said, well, why are people in the UK protesting? This is an American problem. But actually, when you look at the stats, there's there's the picture across the US in terms of deaths and inequality isn't too different. It's the same pattern being replicated yep. in the US and the UK. So I guess, you know, I think what's really interesting from your perspective is that you have seen lots of different um, cultures, you mean to Uganda, and you've seen lots of different healthcare settings. Whereas sometimes, if you in the UK, you just have to accept the accepted narrative, what they're telling you, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I guess like it would be interesting to, to hear kind of what your opinion is on kind of that view of whether it's it's an American problem because it doesn't seem like that to a lot mm-hmm. of people who are people of color in this country. Yeah, um, and I don't, I, and I actually think it's not even an American problem. This is like an international problem. And yeah. especially when I was, I've, I've been, you know, like I said earlier, reading some, you know, the medical literature, especially in the British and, you know, uh, medical journals. And, you know, and I'm so happy that a lot of authors and, you know, scientists and physicians are pushing for, especially the medical field within the UK to, you know, also grapple with its dark history with racism. And with its impact on colonialism. Um, I know that, you know, you have your Public Health England report and it shows all, you know, the ethnic data. And and I remember I was reading their report. I was sad that the word, what I always do when I read certain reports and journals, I look for the word racism to see if it's even mentioned. And I think, and it's not. You know, if, if you yeah. look at the, you know, Public Health England report, unfortunately, that word racism is not mentioned at all. And this right. lets me know, okay, they've not considered the systemic or historical cause of racism, which, you know, the whole uh, colonialism aspect has actually had an impact with them. 
And like I managed, and like I mentioned to you, the reason why I think, especially in Europe and um, in different parts of the world or the so-called developed world, is because they don't want to put blame on whiteness or white supremacy. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of people, it takes them a while to confront that dark history and they don't want to think about it. And I usually try to tell people that, you know, me calling out white supremacy or racism, I'm not trying to say that you're racist. I just want you to understand that we've been educated or, you know, put in a system where it has created all these divisions by race, so much so there's been inequality and we, you know, minority groups have been disproportionately affected by it. And so I try to come from that front with some individuals. And so I feel like um, the UK doing that or even like just, you know, thinking, oh, it's them, it's a them problem, it's an American problem. Um, they're actually very connected to the American history, if you recall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so they're actually even the ones who, even though, yes, fine, they ended and abolished slavery earlier than the U.S., but they brought slavery to the U.S. Uh, okay. There were certain British undertones to the governess and to how to treat um, Black people and Indigenous people. And so at the end of the day, I try to, especially when I engage in such conversations, I tell people that, you know, we have to learn to be uncomfortable these days. We have to become comfortable with the uncomfortable. The yeah. reality is that all these disparities, all this COVID, it is not a black people thing. It is not an Asian thing. It is not an American thing. It yeah. is a we thing, but mostly white people also have to acknowledge their role in creating these disparities, their role in creating this mistrust, so much so that you know a lot of people are worried and rightly yeah. so. Um, so that's sort of where I come from, is that I think that society as a general has to realize the role of structural racism and discrimination in this whole mm -hmm. pandemic, instead of saying, oh, it's a biology. You know? It's a biology, yeah. yeah. Um, we've had a comment from Aguila, um, and, then, and then there is white flight too, from areas that were middle class, but people of color moved into those areas. I guess that's another thing, isn't it? Of people moving out from those areas. Um, yeah, so I know we've talked a lot about COVID. I also want to talk about something that's been in the news recently, which is things to do with childbirth as well. So there's new research again to show that um, basically black, black women are more likely to die in childbirth. And I guess that's kind of, although COVID has shone light on inequality, there are lots of other areas of medicine where that inequality is still there, I guess. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, why do you think that is that? You know, I mean, I know we've talked a lot about it. Maybe the answer yeah. is just like... For sure. <laughs> yeah, and I think the reason is, and what I've seen it as well, and even me being, a, you know, a Black mother, I've also experienced, and I tell these, you know, individuals that, um, you know, when I was a patient way back when, even, you know, and I had some medical knowledge, Unfortunately, when I go into a health system, I have to sometimes use my doctor card because I know that if I don't say, by the way, I'm a physician, they, I feel like I don't get the amount of respect okay. and they assume that I have no literacy, right? Okay. And so what I've seen, a lot of mothers have spoken to me and even it's there in literature mm -hmm. that there's a lot of bias and also misunderstanding. I feel so much so that mothers, when they come in and they say they're in labor or they're in pain, we've had research here. And I've also seen that the British um, you know, literature also has it where black people's pain is not believed. You know? And yeah. so much so their management is poor. There's bias upon their training, especially with mothers that, who are black um, or even minorities, when they're going through, they're, pro they're more likely to go through pregnancy complications, not because of their DNA, it's just because a lot of factors as to, you know, trying to have a high index of suspicion to recognize those complications is very low. Um, yeah. They don't believe the patient, they don't act faster or quicker, the doctor is not summoned as quickly as they should. 
which yeah. is so unfortunate, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the problem right now, um, yeah. especially with maternal mortality. And you're right, it is still fairly high um, and doesn't need to be high. And more so in for mothers of color, um, just because there's a bias or what we call implicit bias to their treatment. And there's mm -hmm. delayed in their treatment. And when you delay in treatment and you have bias, there's more likely a chance the mother and the child you know, doesn't do well. And once again, it's in, steeped in racism. And we have to realize when you enter into the hospitals, who do you mostly see? You will see white nurses and white doctors who have gone through a system where they just don't even, you know, understand it. And you look at other parts in the, you know, European, you know, the Europe as well. Unfortunately, also black mothers, um, Asian mothers are dying at a higher rate than white mothers. And yeah. the reason is, once again, there's that implicit bias to access to treatment, you know, getting access to a doctor, um, making a quick clinical decision. Do we have to operate to get the baby out or not? That is delayed. You, you know, seconds and minutes determine the life of a mother and a child. And so, you know, when I think of my experience, even as a mother, you know, if I didn't have my husband or even that health literacy to push, you know, the doctor do this, I know what is happening in my body now. Um. I, I don't yeah. think I would be here talking to you, you know, and that is the thing we're trying to fight here. Yeah, because it's, it's all, we've got lots of good comments on this. So, yeah. um, Hila says, return to racial disparities are very high in the UK. Um, Zaini, I've read about this, mortality levels are definitely higher within BAME communities. Um, and for a girl, it's such a tragedy that this is still happening. I mean, this is, it seems crazy because we always think of, you know, maternal mortality is something that used to happen 100 years ago, and it's still happening today, and it's really, really shocking. Uh, Akila is shocking, and, and evidence shows that structural racism is definitely in root yeah. cause. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just completely shocking that we still yeah. have these high numbers. And and also, I like just saying, it's replicated across Europe, across America, lots mm -hmm. of different places. So it cannot be um, a, a problem that's restricted to a particular region or particular yes. country. Um, yes. Yeah. So um, just to kind of continue with, like, we were talking about being, um, you know, we have to kind of deal with the uncomfortable. Um, and we've mm -hmm. talked a lot about kind of uh, white supremacy and things like yeah. that. But I also really want to ask you about the kind of um, anti-blackness that you specifically mm -hmm. faced as, as, a, as a black Muslim woman um, within the own, the own community. Because I think that's important to talk about that as well. It's an uncomfortable conversation but it's something yeah. I think that you know BLM really brought that to light and I really want to be interested to hear your view on that as well um yeah so I mean I'll be honest with you even like growing up in Toronto um because yeah. I I was there most of my teenage years and you know mashallah I love my parents you know they really tried to make sure that we had great exposure with different cultures um I mean I was fortunate to go to schools where I had a Pakistani friend, I had an Indian friend, a, you know, Chinese friend, just, just across the board, you know, um, and because of my travels, I'm so fortunate that I've met, you know, individuals, I feel like every continent, I have a friend, I just, uh, I've yet to go to Australia and Antarctica, so, but it's good to know that, you know, I have a friend in every continent, and I believe that's how people should live, you should live your life where, you know, if you, you have to look at your circle and if your circle just has just one type of people, something is wrong. And, and so I feel like the root of anti-blackness comes from that, especially because, you know, a lot of people don't even try to get to know black individuals. And so growing up, I remember that I might've been like the only black person somebody knew, a friend, They're like, you know, you're my first black friend, <laughs> you know, which I thought, well, thank you, but it's also sad. And, you know, what was interesting about that anti-blackness is growing up in, the, you know, especially in the Muslim community, everyone would always ask, you know, oh, when did you convert? You know, or like, they always assumed that yeah. I was like a new Muslim. And what was so irritating was they felt the need to teach me about Quran and pray. And I'm like, um, yeah, we're born Muslim. We know this, you know. Yeah. Um, People don't realize Africans, you know, the continent, we have such a huge, rich history. 
So much so that you look at the scholars and you look at the history of Islam, a lot of people came to Africa for knowledge. We had the best universities. Um, there's the Mali Empire in uh, Western uh, um, Africa. They have the fa famous, you know, masjid there. There is a famous emperor. Um, actually, some people say to date, he's probably the richest man that's ever lived. He's called Mansa Musa, and he was a Mali emperor. And so there, he really pushed for huge universities and understanding. And he was a black man. You know, Arabs came and learned from them. People don't even realize that with Muhammad, Prophet, you know, Muhammad, peace be upon him, his companion, Bilal, you know, he's the one who was the Muaddam. And it's sad because that anti-blackness, even at that time, was during Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there's a lot of hadith that even show Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam trying to educate the Sahaba, please. Yes, he's black, but he is just as you. He is the best of you. You know, he is part of me. Yeah. And so I think because some people, and I remember I was speaking with a scholar, at that time, a lot of Arabs could not even fathom the fact that it was a black man calling the Adhan. Like that is where anti-blackness, I told people, started in Islam. And yeah. so when people come, you know, and now when I look at present day, you know, it is sad because they like to mention Bilal, but they don't yeah. realize, you know, their anti-blackness in that sort. Yeah. And yeah. so, and it all stems once again from racism, you know. People mm -hmm. don't realize that also within our Muslim community, there's a lot of racism. And because it's been perpetuated by, of course, white supremacy, of course, by colonialism. Um, yeah. You know, I've had my Pakistani friends who've told me that you know, one girl, she had to, unfortunately, is not in contact with her family because they would not allow her to marry a black man. You know, yeah. this black man was very, you know, mashallah, good Muslim, you know, education, everything. He's even Muslim, but the parents was like, no, because he's black. And it all stems back to because, you know, white people have shown this narrative that we shouldn't be trusted. Um, we are not good. And, you know, and it's just unfortunate. And it yeah. comes from that. And then sadly, that has, of course, seeped into our religion and in our communities. Yeah. And I think you, you can let me know, even as an Asian person, you know, the dynamics. But for my friends that I speak to now, you know, if they bring a Black person home, yeah. you know, you're, you're going to break ties with certain family members. Yeah. even though the person is Muslim. So that's been my experience. And I've, I've just seen even a lot of people who could not think that I would be a good Muslim because, oh, you need help. Oh, you're black. Let me help you, you know, and yeah. I've had to correct them on that spot, you know. Yeah, but, I mean, I think what strikes me about that is that, um, like, I would have been shocked at that, at that before, but that's a common experience because I've done other interviews where other black women, Muslim women have also said the same thing that they, people automatically assume that they were, um, you know, a, a convert or a revert, um, however you want to say it. And there is that. So it's a common thing. It's you're not the first person, first black Muslim woman who's experienced that. So it's obviously something that is out there. Yeah. Um, the comments, um, Brit Pad Girl, I love the work Dr. Bilal is, where is doing on West African Islam here. Yeah. If you haven't checked out Dr. Bilal's lectures, yes. absolutely amazing. Um, yeah. And, uh, and uh, I know Mustafa Briggs has also done, I think, Sirius on, I think it's Mustafa Briggs on uh, Beyond Bilal, because um, there's yeah. also, I think, a lot of Muslims do know about Hazrat Bilal, but um, in uh, a few of his lectures on Dr. Ware's lectures, they're actually saying that a lot of other prominent personalities um, are also black within, the, you know, his, his historical Islam, but we never mention them. Um, there's an underlying thing in the mosque that certainly that someone is um, there's an assumption about the way they look like I don't you know I don't yeah. know if I've heard that as well but it's always been like oh this person is so beautiful so fair <laughs> there's an assumption there um, and so his lectures also touch upon that that actually there are a lot of other personalities that Hadith show that they were also black as well yeah um, and oh yeah and brick pack girl Charmaine. That's, hi Charmaine. there's so many great american black muslims doing work to educate everyone on this zany unfortunately there are high levels of racism within the muslim community um we need to raise awareness i love these ideas stem from culture which people conflict with the religion i think that's interesting because i think what you're also saying is that none of these things are accidents right so yeah. um i think what was interesting what you said is that 
we assume that it's an accident that this happened, but it's been reverse engineered by colonialism. Um, it's not an accident. It's meant to be that way. Someone has planned for you to think in that way. So it's, we assume that this racism came from nowhere. But what yeah. you're saying is that actually it's not an accident. Somebody wants you. It's his, the historical narrative. We're talking about colonialism. This is also an yeah. effect of colonialism, which we might not realize that it, this is what has happened, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yep, and I totally agree with you. And I think, and I encourage, you know, whoever's listening and your viewers that, you know, reassess all your education. You know, ask yourself, why have I only been learning and reading about white people? And so, <laughs> and, you know, even whenever we're learning about other people, we're considered, you know, it's all of a sudden considered, oh, exotic, oh, ethnic, you know, so much so you go to the supermarket. Um, I don't know about you guys in the UK, but here I know in the US, there's literally what they call the ethnic aisle. And I'm like, what's up with that? It makes no sense, you know? And so people don't realize down to the supermarket, everything has been governed by white supremacy. And that's what I tell people. It's all related to white supremacy. I know people don't want to hear it, but I feel like the more I say it, hopefully mm. we'll become comfortable saying it and having this discussion. And the reality is, I know for me, um, except in Uganda, most of my education has been in white spaces. I'm in currently in white spaces. And I've decided not to remain silent. I talk to individuals, you know, even my colleagues, you know, who are white men. I say, you know, you're a white man. There's certain things you can get away with while you're working in the hospital that me as a black woman, I can't. You know, and all of this trickles down, like we said, in every part of our society, from our Muslim community, where we, you know, we feel that to be associated or affiliated with whiteness is somehow to be pure. Hence why some people don't want to even be, you know, married to a black person. They need to be married to somebody who's fair skinned or something like that. So, yeah, I totally agree with what you said. And. Um... I think I hope, I hope Instagram doesn't cut us off. I think we've got about five yeah. minutes. Um, okay. So I think we're playing World Foods, yeah. So we do have ethnic World Foods aisle. Um, I always, I don't know if you guys have a Ramadan special kind of aisle, but I always find it's full of the food that I don't generally tend to eat. Like, you know, I've, I think I'm third generation Asian in this country now. So mostly what we eat will reopen our fast, and we'll probably have a special on that as well later yeah. down the line. Like it's mainly things that everybody else eats. It's not necessarily. Uh, Asian or Pakistani food or whatever, right? Okay. Um, and Zaini, um, sorry, I don't do negative. No, we want to have uncontrolled. There's nothing negative. Um, this is a huge issue in our curriculum. History we learned about in schools is white centric and very limited. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, also, I mean, you would think that as a British person, uh, we would might learn. We learned about the Industrial Revolution. We never learned about what powered the Industrial Revolution. Um, <laughs> where we got all the money from, and uh, it's not something we've ever covered. Um, yeah, and there's a huge history there, and there's, there's also, and I think what I find quite funny is that um, I mean, I think we've got over five minutes, but yeah, um, <laughs> conversation about statues as well, which we could touch upon. Yeah, um, erase our history. Well, actually, I don't think we should erase history. I think we want to hear more of the history that's. Let's be honest. Let's 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 have more yes. of the history, of British history. Let's tell it the full story. Um, the full story, exactly. Because uh, the one pet peeve I have is when I watch British period movies. They're all white people, like Downton Abbey, and I'm like, come on, black people were existed during that time. And so, even into film, every sector of our society, people have to ex ignore that there were no black or Asians or you know other minorities in the group. And so yeah. we just have to unlearn what we've been taught. <laughs> I mean, also there was, I think it was really funny because I think it's a film and I'm, I always get film names wrong, but there was a film, I think it was 1914, I think. People in the comments can correct me. And then there was like a slight controversy because there was some Sikhs in it. And it's like, well, actually there was quite a lot of, you know, <laughs> from the um, British Empire fighting in World War One and World War Two, And then once the actual research on that, it was like, well, actually, no, no, it's actually quite accurate that there were Sikhs in that <laughs> army. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Keila says, yes, peace dramas, revisionist history, so annoying. Um, I think in the last five minutes, I just want to ask you, uh, how has this whole COVID experience been for you? And also, you know, how are you? How, how is your own mental health during the time when you've had to go through, as a doctor, it's been so difficult seeing what you've seen? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. I'll be honest, those first couple of months, um, 
that sort of winter of 2020 to spring 2020, it was hard because you were just like, oh my gosh, this is actually happening. And it was frustrating because a lot of people were not also being careful. And then you're worried as a doctor. And so we're in training. And so we were just in it, knee deep in it, you know, mm. and I was fortunate. I still, ha you know, I didn't catch COVID. So, which was great. I really took measures. Um, of course, you know, we have two children. You just met here, my daughters. And so I was just more worried about them. Um, mm. So it has taken a toll, um, especially those early months. But I think now, you know, we've probably learned about COVID. And so we are very mindful. And I always tell people, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I wish we can go back to normal. And, you know, and I keep telling people, you know what, we're never going back to 2019. Mm -hmm. And I think another, dis you know, understanding is people have to realize the so-called normal was not great for a lot of people, especially yeah. black people, Asian people. And so <laughs> the people who are saying we want to go back to normal are mostly white people. Because, you know, they want to do, they want to live a life to ignore, once again, conversations. Yeah. And so, you know, I feel like, I'll be honest, a lot of people may, this is not an unpopular opinion, but I think COVID in its many ways has been a blessing because it has yeah. allowed us to press the pause button and reassess. Um, mm -hmm. Personally, my mental health and well-being, it's given me time to reflect and ponder mm -hmm. and like I said earlier, I am not afraid to have difficult conversations because I think people need to just be honest with themselves and yeah. especially honest about racism and white supremacy. That's yeah. how we got in this mess, really. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't wanna, I don't want Instagram to cut us off, okay. but I feel like we need to have another conversation because this has been so interesting. Like, there's yeah. so many things I haven't asked you about, um, okay. especially what you're saying about kind of things going back to normal. There's a whole other conversation we could delve into about the election and Trump yeah. and so many other things, but I feel like we need to have another another type. Oh, really yes. And let's do it again soon. Um, that would yeah. be really good. So um, thank you so much. Is this your first Instagram live, by the way? It was. I wonder like how it works. Hopefully, I'll able to see the recording later. <laughs> yes, we'll put it up, and um, yeah, it'll be on YouTube hopefully, and also Instagram, IGTV. But okay. um, yeah, I mean, I think you know, let's have another one soon. Um, yes, thank I would you. love it. All right, thank you so much. Well, <laughs> all right, thank you to everyone who is participating. Feel free to follow me on Instagram and Twitter, Ramala Kasozi MD. <laughs> yes, we'll put up your social channels as well. Um, okay. Thank you so much. It's been really, really interesting. I've really enjoyed it. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right, bye. -bye.